Two years ago, I was driving home late from work on Halloween of all nights. I'd been stuck in the office way, way later than usual, working the tight end of a project with a guy who had a job lined up elsewhere and had otherwise totally checked out. I was angry. The least he could do was be professional about it, and if he was mad at the firm, why take it out on me? Anyway, it's like 8pm, I'm starving, and admittedly, I'm doing about 50 in a 30. Then out of nowhere, this little trick-or-treater steps out in front of my car, then freezes, legitimately like a deer in headlights, and just stares at me as I slam on the brakes. I was so sure I was about to hit her, and I know this is low, but... I covered my eyes with my hands because I just couldn't bear to see this little girl, kid, get smashed. But then, by the time I stopped, I opened my eyes to see she's still standing there. She looks terrified and you can hardly blame her. So, I open my car door, step out just enough to talk to her and ask her if she's okay. She just sort of blinks at me and I assume she's just in shock, so I ask again. But yet again, she doesn't answer. She just sort of looks at me and doesn't say a word. Then, right as I'm about to ask her where her mom and dad are, this big black van, the kind with the sliding door, appears out of nowhere and skids to a stop next to her. The middle door slides open and a man gets out, and I think this might be the kid's family or something, but the way the guy grabbed her, the way the girl screamed when the strange man picked her up, it gave me the distinct impression that whatever just happened was far from wholesome. I found somewhere to pull over, took out my cell phone and immediately called the cops. I told them everything, what the girl looked like, what her costume looked like, the make and model of the van along with as much of the license plate as I could remember. I sat there in my car, eyes closed and tried to picture everything I saw in intimate detail. I assume I'd be seeing something about on the news. I mean, whenever a kid goes missing, especially a violent abduction or whatever, it's normally all over the news, right? Not this time. I didn't see a single mention of it anywhere. I tried searching online too and I didn't find a single report about black fans or child abductions anywhere around Kansas City. It makes me think I misunderstood what I saw. It makes me doubt myself. Maybe the kid was just, I don't know, disabled in some way and gotten lost while trick-or-treating. There's a hundred different ways to rationalize it, but every time I remember the way the guy grabbed her and the way that kid screamed, I don't know. I think I witnessed something terrible and whoever's responsible had gotten away with it completely. When I was 11 years old, I took my little sister trick-or-treating in our neighborhood Long story short, there was a lot of trouble back home between my mom, my dad, and my stepdad, this guy called Craig. Craig was a jerk, my mom was a drunk, and dad was fighting for custody of us. As you can imagine, it was incredibly stressful, and it definitely accounts for one of the most miserable times in my life. But that night's trick-or-treating ended with an absolute low point that I feel very lucky to have escaped. So I took my sister around the neighborhood and we did okay in terms of our candy haul. Then by curfew time I walked her back to our house where we found Craig was waiting for us. He looked livid but we weren't late coming back or anything. So as my sister walked back into the house I gave her my bag of candy while Craig walked off toward the garage. I kept asking him what was going on but he wouldn't say anything to me and as he handed me some gloves, a shovel and a trash bag it felt a whole lot like I was being punished for something I didn't do. Then, as I followed him into the woods behind his house, I saw that he had a little hatchet in his hand. The last time I saw anyone with these items in tow, it was some neighbors going to butcher a deer that had been caught on their property. Poor thing had almost disemboweled itself on some razor wire and bled out during the night, and our neighbors must have had a heck of a time getting rid of it. So, as much as I'm kind of nervous about what's going to greet me at the end of our little walk, I couldn't have any idea how horrible it truly was. After about 10-15 to 15 minutes of walking, Craig tells me to stop and start digging a hole where I'm stood. I ask why and he tells me to shut up and do as I'm told. 
which wasn't out of the ordinary, but after only a few scoops of dirt, he stops me. He asks if I want to know why I'm digging, and of course I told him yes, and he tells me that I'm actually digging my own grave. I thought it might have been a Halloween prank or something. One in bad taste, sure, but a prank nonetheless. Then he starts telling me about how my dad has a custody hearing coming up in two weeks and that it's my job to make sure that he doesn't win. If he did win, the hole I was in the middle of digging would become my grave. I was 11, dude. 11 years old. And this grown man is telling me how I need to, like, stop some entire legal proceeding or whatever. That, or he'd kill me, presumably with the hatchet he had in his hand. After that, we picked up all the stuff we'd brought out with us, then walked back to the house. All these years later, parts of me wonder why I didn't react more viscerally to actually being threatened with murder. I didn't cry. I didn't run. I just sort of accepted it. I imagine this is what my therapist calls my childhood traumas, and that I was just so burned out with the abuse and fear and the misery that I just took it in my stride. But I'm sure you'll all be pleased to hear that my dad ended up winning custody purely on the basis of him not having any kind of criminal record while my mom's and Craig's rap sheet was like a mile long. Craig wasn't so smart either, as when the judge ruled in my dad's favor, me and my sister went right home with him. We never saw Craig again, and since my mom refuses to leave him, I haven't actually seen my mom since the hearing. We've talked on the phone a bunch, but I've no desire to see her in person. Not if Craig is still around. I grew up in a place called Fells Point in Baltimore. It's like an old Polish neighborhood, mostly low to middle income housing, but it's about a 15 to 20 minute walk away from Mount Vernon and the Arts District, which is where some of the nicest neighborhoods in the city are. Back when we were kids, I'm talking like maybe 9 to 13 years old, our parents wouldn't let us trick-or-treat anywhere too far away from Fells Point or Little Italy. But first year of high school, right when we're on the cusp of being too old to even trick-or-treat in the first place, our parents tell us we're allowed to go out unsupervised and with a later curfew. By us, I mean my friend Nick and my friend George. We know we have to make the most of this newfound freedom, which is when George comes up with a plan that we all thought was a pure masterstroke of genius. Instead of trick-or-treating around some broke neighborhood, we could walk over to Mount Vernon and farm all the rich people candy instead. I mean, in actual fact, we found the nicer neighborhoods to be even less down with Halloween than friggin' Greek town, but at the time, we got it into our dumb heads that we'd be getting like full-size candy bars, whole bags of loose candies, dumb ideas like that. So, we got into our costumes, then met up on the corner before heading over to Mount Vernon. But before we left, Nick stops us, puts on some cartoonishly spooky voice and says something like, May the dark Lord Satan bless our journey, brothers. George, whose parents were like hardcore Greek Orthodox and brought him up the same way, starts trying to give Nick a stinger, telling him to stop invoking the name of Satan and stuff. We just start laughing and he always thought that Christian stuff made him look righteous when, in reality, it just gave away that he was a total mama's boy. Anyway, the more George is getting mad at all the Satan stuff, the more Nick is doing it, and almost every time we got candy around Mount Vernon, Nick would wait until the person had shut their door before being like, Hail Satan, brothers. The Dark Lord provides. It was super funny, and seeing George almost burst a blood vessel every time he said it was even funnier. So we're just walking the streets of Mount Vernon, running out of doorbells to ring, lots of art galleries and other stuff eating up whole blocks there, when we have an idea. The whole time, we hadn't been walking past anything that even resembled an apartment building. We'd have to buzz someone to let us in, and hope the person whose buzzer we pushed had some Halloween spirit about them. You get it. It wasn't an ideal trick-or-treat setup. But given we were running out of real estate and we were still entertaining this idea of there being these stashes of super candy or whatever, we decided to roll the dice on it. 
We walk down the path of one while we're studying the windows to see if anyone has any Halloween decorations on show. Nick just walks up to the little push pad thing and just mashes all the buttons. Lo and behold, a few seconds later the door to the apartment buzzes and audibly unlocks. Somebody's always expecting somebody, I remember Nick saying. I know we got that from a movie, I just can't remember which one. Anyway, once we get inside the building we start knocking on apartment doors, getting told to buzz off by most people and by the third floor, we're getting pretty tired of walking up each flight of stairs. That's when George has the bright idea of catching the elevator up to the top floor then working our way down. Trust the fat kid to come up with that one, necessity being the mother of invention and all that. So, we get in the elevator which was a little sketchy but otherwise okay looking and hitched a ride to the top floor. This place only had like eight or nine floors, or lazy sewer, so it was a very brief ride to the top of the building. But for the 30 seconds or so that we're in the elevator, Nick is putting on this deep voice, rolling his eyes, holding his hands out in front of him like a wizard or something and being like, Hail Satan, may his candy gifts be bountiful. George just loses it, punches him in the arm and starts yelling at him about how he shouldn't be messing with things like that. The elevator reaches the ninth floor. Nick says, whatever, then goes to step out. But George grabs him by the arm, pulls him back and starts shouting at him. And I swear to God about if he keeps talking about Satan and... Right when he says Satan, the freaking elevator just dropped into free fall for like a split second before stopping again. It was enough of a drop that Maybe only like half of the opening was still visible, but my god, did we freak out. Scrambling out through the opening that remained, each assuming it'd be us the elevator dropped on. We all got out okay and the elevator didn't drop anymore, but we were just out of our minds, man. People were coming out of their apartments to see what all the fuss was about and then asking who let us in. It was a whole thing. Then one of the residents made a comment about calling the cops to have us taken home, we all just made a break for the stairwell. Like it probably would have been a good idea to get a ride home, but we were just so on edge after the whole elevator thing that we just bailed as soon as anyone mentioned 911. After that, we all went our separate ways and dealt with the trauma alone for the night. I want to make it clear at this point that I totally understand what happened was nothing more than a total fluke. Yeah, it was really freaking scary, but I don't think anything supernatural was at play. It doesn't matter if it was Halloween, and it doesn't matter that Nick was hailing Satan all night. But that's not what George thinks, no siree. I mean, some of you might have been able to guess that George saw the whole thing as a huge affirmation of faith, and I wish I could say that he got tired of saying I told you so, but he didn't. The thing that gets me, though, is how instead of being like, don't be a baby, there's no such thing as Satan, Nick seemed to actually believe it. He never came out and said it, and it's not like he started going to church or anything, but he wasn't his usual cocky self whenever the subject came up, and he always just went quiet whenever George suggested he had actually invoked Satan. Couple that with the fact he definitely picked up an interest in spirits and the beyond after the incident, and I don't know. I think Nick really did start believing that something else was at work that night. I was 13 years old when this happened on Halloween night in 2015. Since I had been sitting around all day, at 9pm I decided to go for a walk out in the woods. It was one of my favorite things to do, since everything looked so different out in the dark and that there were no people around. I really loved the cool night air and the spooky feeling of the woods and the nearby pond. I would started walking past my neighbor's blue house when they were having a huge Halloween party. There were flashing lights at the windows and music blaring, and I could hear all the drunk people raving in the yard. But soon enough, I had made it to the quiet woods like I had planned. As I was walking on the forest path, I started to feel very nervous and paranoid. I couldn't really see where I was going, and eventually had to take my earbuds off to be more aware of my surroundings. The feeling of uneasiness started to fade for a moment as I made it through the woods and onto a street near the one I lived on. I turned the corner back to my street, my earbuds back on, 
and blasting nightcore, now almost relieved that I was almost home. I started to think I was being stupid for getting so jumpy over nothing, but then a thin figure appeared from behind the still lively blue house, and I immediately tensed back up. As the figure got closer, I placed my house keys between my fingers like I learned from the internet, and tried to make out what I was seeing. The figure was a man, fairly tall, bald, and wearing a black suit. He was also ghost white, and due to my poor vision, I literally almost shit myself thinking it was Slenderman himself coming to take me. A moment later though, I noticed that he did in fact have a face, and he had painted it to look like a skull. The man was obviously wasted and he was staggering in a zigzag motion across the empty street right towards me. For a split second, I was hoping he was too hammered to even notice me, but that hope quickly faded as he made his way right to me. I was absolutely paralyzed with fear. My house was only two houses away, but I'd have to get past this unpredictable man and I had no idea if I could outrun him with my asthma. Panicking, I was considering other ways to get away from him into safety. Could I turn back and maybe take a long way around to the other end of my street? No. It's dark. There's no one around and I could definitely not run for that long. Can I make it to my grandma's house? Can't do that either. There's no guarantee that she's awake or even home. As I was trying to decide, my thoughts were interrupted as the man put a hand tightly on my shoulder. He started speaking, but I couldn't hear him properly due to my music still playing in my ears. All I managed to hear was him questioning what girl my age was doing out alone so late at night. I could only stand there and stare. The man then paused, raised his arm, and then pointed a finger to the woods behind the houses and then said something. It was at this point that I decided if I didn't do something, soon my body would definitely end up being found in the woods. I looked at the woods, then at the guy, shook him off, and broke into a full-on sprint past him at my house, crossing some of that blue house's property. At my front door, I was furiously stabbing my key into the old rusting lock with my shaky hands, fearing that any second that man would come grab me from behind and drag me into the dark forest on the other side of my yard. I finally managed to get inside and made sure the door stayed locked before I could finally breathe again. I threw my shoes off and made my way into the basement as my tears started rolling down my face. Sobbing, I had told my older brother what was going on and together we called our parents who weren't home at the time. They said they would check it out and we didn't call the police since it was a little town and no harm was actually done. The next day, my dad had informed me that the drunk man was actually just one of the taxi drivers in our town, and we just never spoke of it again. It's six years later, and I still get extremely nervous going outside after dark, even though I don't live anywhere near that place anymore. I've told this story to my friends a few times, and it honestly sort of annoys me that I didn't get as much as an apology from that guy. I really honestly hate the whole town, and the fact that no one there does anything when things like this happen. I'm glad I live in a bigger place now, where we at least have street lights. After listening to a bunch of Halloween horror stories, it reminded me of something that happened to me when I was 15. For some context, I'm a guy, and I was trick-or-treating with four of my friends who I'll call J, D, A, and T. We wanted to have some extra fun this time for two reasons. One, this was our first time trick-or-treating in what we called our late teens. The second reason was this might have been our last time trick-or-treating because of how busy our life would soon become due to academic reasons. This did turn out to be the case, but not for the reason we thought. We were walking down some random street when we saw a house with insane decorations to the point where we almost thought it wasn't even a house. We walked up to the door and then before we could even ring the doorbell, some guy opened the door. This alone already put the five of us on alert. He then said, Sorry, we're out. This honestly relieved us, and then we just walked away, not saying a word. We continued walking down the road, and then turned to walk to Jay's house. As we were walking, Dee had stopped us, and then pointed out, Yo, who is that? We turned around and then saw a shadow about 75 feet from behind us. We gave it no thought and just continued walking. We eventually made it to Jay's house about 10 minutes later. 
His parents weren't home, so we could be as loud as we wanted. We had started playing video games in his room. That is, until we heard a scream. What the hell? We all turned and yelled when we saw the guy from the house at Jay's window, trying to open it. Now, I was in a marching band at my school at the time, but what people didn't know was just how much it developed my legs. I stormed towards the window, opened it with so much force that it would have cracked the wall if I did it any harder, and then I kicked the guy straight in the face. He staggered back, and then I quickly closed the window. This may seem over the top, but I swear it actually happened. We then saw him run away, and we decided to stay the night just to make sure nothing happened to Jay. Why didn't we call the cops? Because we didn't feel like it was necessary that five 15-year-old guys could easily overpower one old guy with a broken nose. But it's not like it mattered, because we never saw him again after that. And thank God for that. For a little background information on myself, I work for one of the largest haunted houses in the United States. My family has owned and operated this location for more than 30 years. I'm not going to say exactly where it is, but I will say that most people probably know it. The event I'm about to tell you happened around 2005. For more obvious reasons, October is one of our most busiest months. We often hire people that have worked for the haunted house before, and when we were short staff, we will ask the co-workers to see if they have anybody they know that would be interested in working for the season. So this particular Halloween event, we had going on, we were desperate for staff, as the town was having a large event, and it brought a crazy amount of traffic through our location, more than usual. Now back in these days, we didn't really have Craigslist, or indeed to hire people. It was more word of mouth, or we could put an ad out on the newspaper. So with that being said, one day we have a man, who was in his early 20s. His name is Joseph, and he appeared to be a drifter. Now, some of you that don't know what a drifter is, it's more or less just someone that's homeless, that likes to travel a lot. Now, this wasn't too uncommon in our town. It was kind of a hot spot for this kind of activity. I gave Joseph a pretty formal interview. I knew that he wouldn't have any documentation, and offered to pay him under the table. Joseph had experience working with special effects and makeup. At least he said he did. So I didn't really question it. I told him what time to start, and I paid him a little bit up front, because he seemed to be a little bit down, and it seemed like the right thing to do. Joseph was going to start Halloween Day, and would be doing the makeup on all the staff. Everybody seemed to be having a good time, families were coming in, tickets were being sold. In about an hour into the event, I had a couple of regular employees come to me saying that they smelled something that resembled blood, or like that of hard copper smell. If you've ever worked for a butcher or by a slaughter plant, you'll know what I'm talking about. I hadn't really thought about it at this point, but as soon as he mentioned to me, I also smelt it. It was very odory and strong, and as I passed by my employees, it became stronger. I noticed that my employees were covered in fake blood, but as I looked at it, the way it dried on their skin looked all too real. I asked them where they got this fake blood from, and almost simultaneously they said Joseph. Now keep in mind I'm trying to run this event, and we have close to 40 employees there, as well as close to 100 people walking around. But finally I come up to Joseph and I can see his hands covered in the same substance. As I approach him the smell hits me like a brick wall. Now at this point, I know for a fact that it's actually real blood. I asked Joseph what the hell he thought he was doing, and within seconds the man lost his shit. I mean he absolutely screamed and yelled like somebody was stabbing him. Up until the point he seemed so calm. Already eyes were starting to look at us from around, and I was trying to calm down the situation to not start a panic. I told Joseph we could talk about the situation in my office. What he did next was something straight out of a horror movie. Joseph goes on to pick up the bucket that he was using, runs right past me and to the others into a large crowd of people, and tosses the bucket all over them. I just stood there with my jaw wide open, not really sure what to say or do. As I was trying to piece together everything that was happening, Joseph got away. I couldn't find him anywhere, all the while trying to comfort everyone, telling them all that it was just a joke, and another employee had called the police by this point. 
They arrived within a couple of minutes, and I had a lot of questions to answer, but no answers to give. The guy didn't give me any idea, so I couldn't tell him exactly what his real name was. All I knew was that it was Joseph. The only thing I could tell them was a brief description of him. He was tall, blinky. His skin seemed sun-dried and damaged despite his age. He had long black hair and, surprisingly enough, a perfect smile. They never did find out who it was or what his intentions were, nor did we ever find out where the blood came from, and I think it's the scariest part of the whole situation. I actually had a pretty decent scare back when I was 14, and I'm in my early 20s now. So some of the more intricate details are a little hazy, but I'll try to tell it as accurately as I can remember. So the story happened on Halloween night in 2013. Me and my three friends, Dallas, AJ, and Anthony, had all collectively decided that we would meet up at my house to begin trick-or-treating, as my house was located right next to the wealthier neighborhood in the city. Our game plan to maximize our trick-or-treating efficiency was to start off at my house, then work our way down towards the nice neighborhood, and then loop around. Before we began, Anthony mentioned that he had bought some weed, and so we all smoked some in the alleyway by my house before we began. We made our way through my neighborhood, in a decent bit into the nice neighborhood before we decided to start heading back so we could get to the houses on the opposite side of the street as we started making our way towards my house. Unfortunately, it was already pretty late at this point, and so a lot of the houses had already started turning off their lights. By the time we were almost out of the nicer neighborhood, just about every house had turned their lights off, except for this one that was attached to a bunch of other townhouses. We being the desperate candy-starved teenagers that we were, weren't going to let the late hour of the night sway us from our potential earnings. So we all made our way up onto the porch and rang the doorbell. We waited for a decent bit, probably a good 30 seconds, before we finally heard some loud thumping behind the door. It was an older male, probably in his early 40s. He answers the door in a stained tank top and a pair of denim boxers. The guy looked like he hadn't showered or shaved in like a solid week, but he did seem pretty nice though, despite his appearance. And he made some sort of joke about us being the only trick-or-treaters out there, as we had stayed out later than everyone else and so we deserved a better reward than the rest of them. He told us to wait there just for a moment while he went and got some treats for us. None of us really found his appearance weird, and I partially blamed the weed that we'd smoked earlier, as we weren't as paranoid about him as much as we were paranoid that some cops would see us walking down the street and somehow know that we smoked. We heard his thumping footsteps as he walked around his house, and then a couple of minutes later, he then came back with some black DVD boxes. He held them out like a deck of cards, and he told us to take what we wanted. As he said this, he cracked a smile, and I remember thinking about just how gross his yellow jagged teeth were. We looked at the covers, and they were all adult movies, some of them not even featuring females on the cover. AJ made a comment about the movies, saying we just wanted candy, but the guy just smiled wider with his crooked yellow teeth, seeming to stick out of his mouth, and then he said, I know what kids your age like to do. Don't worry. It's okay. You can trust me. I'm cool. At this point, me and my friends all began awkwardly shuffling away from the porch, politely declining his offer, when the man put his hands on his underwear, then started rubbing himself as he begged us to stay and then come inside so we could watch movies together. He said that he'd let us eat all the candy we want and other really disturbing things. While he was still going on his tangent, me and my friends all collectively decided to book it towards my house, pillowcases full of candy awkwardly being shuffled in our arms. We ran out of the nice neighborhood and down this large hill that the nice neighborhood sat on top of, before forking it left onto the city street that would lead to my house. Before we made it out of the nice neighborhood, I remember looking back and seeing the grown man chase after us for the first part but then giving up shortly after and going back into his house. We eventually made it to my house and went directly into the basement through a set of stairs that was in the back of my house. While we were in there, 
We all collectively talked about just how insane what happened was, and we wondered if the weed we smoked had made it seem weirder or maybe more normal than it actually was. Either way, we egged his house the next day, and we never went back there for Halloween ever again. 